Thank you very much for having me. I'm very thrilled to be back in Oregon again. I came here once before when you were trying to get clean elections, and when I was asked to come again, I knew that, that some very brave people are here. I'm going to give you a, a written speech, which I do because if I don't have a manuscript, I start going afield. <laughs> and then when I finish it, I'm going to answer all the questions that you ask me. If I can't answer them, I'll tell you so. But if I do, my, everything I say will be true. <laughs> A growing number of Americans. Now, is this odd? And can you hear me way up there? Yeah. That I can speak with a regular voice without shouting? Good. A growing number of Americans are beginning to identify with the pro-democracy activities whose courage opened much of the world to freedom in the final decades of the 20th century. We remember and honor the poet revolutionary Vaclav Havel of Czechoslovakia, where Charter 77 rendered the flowers and songs of a velvet revolution, more powerful than the guns of oppression. When we remember the shipyard hero like Valenza of Poland, we remember those who stood nonviolently in Russia, in Yugoslavia, in Tenement Square, mm. in East and West Germany. It was their fearless living that ended the Cold War, not Reagan's saber rattling. <laughs> When people stand united with certain courage against oppression, they get their way. That is an axiom in the geometry of world history. To say we are pressed in America sounds remarkably like the whining of spoiled children. We live such privileged lives compared to many in the world. It is true. We have our cars and, and our homes and our apartments, most of us, and our television shows and our clean cities and glittering stores, cornucopias and theaters and a thousand kinds of systems and conveniences and communication devices and all the rest that seem to work and serve us with well-maintained reliability. Living in the midst of such luxury, it is hard to imagine that one might not be free, that freedom might be an illusion, a fraud. Was the hoop-skirted antebellum southern belle living her life in this plantation mansion amid her luxuries, a free human being? Or was she as constrained from independent action as the slave who served her luxury? Our homes are now filled with the cheap products of slave societies, mm. and our streets are safe mm. because those who dare move against the system are locked away to in the millions so that their forced labor can serve us too. But we are free and happy, we think. We are Americans. We need no velvet revolution, for our lives are sufficient. They are velvet couches made in China, affordable to us because the best part of the price is paid by others, by the young worker in China, by the unemployed fellow in our own hometown, and by his children who pay in a thousand ways. So we have it made. Yes, it is a 
problem that we Americans use a third of the world's resources, and that global pollution and the balance of our trade are all completely unsustainable and that we can only get the cheap resources we desire by destroying democracies around the world and installing dictators to whom we can dictate. <coughs> and all this sowing of bitterness is a harvest of terrorism now and to come. But we can at least live for today in our freedom and our happiness we empire's debutantes need not look out our plantation house window to the slave quarters in the distance when the same window will give us our beautiful reflections. But the small everyday injustices of a population must now somewhere indeed they land and add, they gather into great rivers that flow through capitals and pentagons where the selfish energies combine and become the bombs and the machine gun roar and the rattle of our bloody agents in the world. Our vote every four years is a weak ceremony of little importance compared to how we live our personal lives which empowers either good or evil in the world. But as for our freedom, what do we have left of it? No man or woman is free whose life is built upon the suffering of others. Slavery enslaves the master more than the slave, for the master is enslaved in mind as well as body. And so we take off our shoes at the airport and are too dumbed down to think why. <laughs> and we send our children to factory schools that are the abattoirs of their tender imaginations and grand potentials. And we are too hypnotized to think much of it. We bow our heads to our bosses without the clear mind to mourn for our human dignity, for we dare not miss a paycheck, or else the credit card and mortgage bails on our backs will come crashing down on us, and that is all that matters. We have been programmed to believe, not think. Our lives have been stolen, we have no place to go, no meaningful choices, only meaningless consumer choices. Decide to live the life of a poet or a vagabond or a philosopher and count the cost of that. Can you afford it? Can you afford freedom? Are you free to make big changes in your life or do you have too many obligations to others? Financial entanglements have come to define human relationships so that the elite may prosper. Was it not ever so? Did not the frontier farmers and the townspeople feel the constraints of their position, their obligations to family, to church, to community? They did. So, I remember this life it was imperfect, but it was different than today. Today, it, people choose their oppressions and build lives. They were pawns in their own schemes and social hierarchies and the fodder for the wars of the elites. But there was a sense of freedom in those days that is missing now. Today's oppressions have organized in some inhuman way that serves against our interests and against the interests of society itself more permanently and aggressively. It is advanced in so many new ways from unnecessary wars built upon great lies to elect 
election frauds and the dismantling of social programs by the device of other great lies and the creation of permanent war so that power over us may be extended forever in ways small and grave our shoes are to come off at the airport our children are to be shot and blown up and our debt is to be the great burden that keeps the bales upon our backs and all of us in our places. There is, in other words, a permanently vicious aspect to life today that was only an occasional visitor to us before, before the wars came, when the Union, and then the wars came and the Union contract expired. The boot of greedy oppression is now always at our necks, it seems. And like medical companies who own Congress or oil companies who own White Houses, it seemed to have become the nature of the beast, widely understood and generally, if grudgingly, accepted. But the pursuit of happiness, there it is, a phrase central to the world's idea of America. If some people in this country could erase those three words from our declaration, they would do so and replace them with something more religious or otherwise authoritarian and demanding of obedience instead of the nurturing of our human potentials. But the words remain there on that parchment and indelibly upon our hearts and imaginations. That is why there is a velvet revolution brewing. And it is not the whining of spoiled children, but the song of freedom of brave men and women who are prepared to let the bales upon their backs fall and mix with the old tea in the harbor. <laughs> and this phrase, the pursuit of happiness, the central red magma of our collective political souls, the energy source of all our revolutions, including this one, calls not for our selfish enjoyment of other people's labors, but for the freedom to live meaningful lives in a land of justice, where our democracy is our tool to better the earth as a happy human outpost in the cold universe a warm reprieve from the heartless and fatal logic of time and space, and a reflection here and now of God's love, or absent that according to your beliefs, I best make due substitute. But brotherhood is, is enough, and democracy is our belief in brotherhood and our commitment to it. I have long admired the Europeans for the fact that they discuss politics constantly. The sidewalk cafe conversation is superior for the maintenance of democracy when compared to our sitting in front of endless dumbed down news broadcasts and newspaper accounts. Even during disclosure of election fraud in Ohio, the news channels all but ignored it, and the main story in the New York Times, even as senators stood against a sham election, was a long report on the disruption made to Congress's mindless train schedules. The sharing of email and our occasional standing in protests is the best we Americans can do to create the community of democracy and raise the barricades of establishments. Or is it? We tend to fall into the politics of victimization and anger. We are defensive when in fact our only real success must come from another way, from the promotion and spreading 
of a lifestyle that we model with lives of joy and justice and sustainable common sense and from a mending of the split in American culture that now colors our national map. But we are not reds and blues. We share beliefs in common, freedom, justice, unity, brotherhood. War breeds consumer materialism. The Civil War brought the Gilded Age the First World War brought the Roaring Twenties. The Second World War brought on the material binge we now maintain with ad hoc wars as necessary. Wars destroy all of the values, leaving only materialism. Can the process work backwards? Can we bring peace? by living in more sensible and beautiful ways. Yes, for the future is always being forged in the present. Lives of joy, if we create them, will bring joyous fruit. <coughs> I'm too damn old. <laughs> Serving each other is the joy of life. It does us no good to rise up every four years and comb through housing projects and poor neighborhoods begging for votes. When we were needed there all along, what I'm saying to you now is what I learned in 19, in 2004, when I, 2003, when I went 23,000 miles in a car around all the swing states of this country looking to urge people to vote. And we spent a great deal of time in the black African-American uh, ghettos. And this is what they said to us. They only come when they want our votes. The rest of the time, they don't care about us. So I say that housing projects and poor neighborhoods begging for food when we were needed there all along, needed to bring joy and education to the children, resources to parents, tools for self-representation and community progress. In the current, in the current days, what we do is go there once every four years. And what really bothered us the most was the young people who had served time and could not vote. And you ask them if they would write, would they sign and vote? And they said, felon, which means that they had been caught smoking marijuana with a few more cigarettes in their car that were not allowed, ended up in prison for a year or two or more, and then come out as a felon believing that they could not vote. They had paid the price, but still they were not able to vote. And that has to be checked into and something done about it. The, <laughs> the work of a successful party or movement depends on how well it organizes people every day for the improvement of free and joyful living, for the power to shape their futures and care for their children, for the power to extend their higher values into the world and thus serve their dreams of brotherhood, justice, and the peace that comes naturally from brotherhood and justice. And this peace needs no armies, no preemptive slaughter, no torture chambers, not even the taking off of our shoes at the airports, as if our old globe were still large enough for us to be safe in an unjust world of only we'll take off our shoes. 
The poor of this country are so deprived of options that they now flock to churches where the government money now comes so that people can be turned away from the idea that government, democracy, is our common tool for serving each other's needs. If a party or a movement is to be successful, it must become that place where people go for personal help, like the Union Hall or the old Grange Hall or the thing we must see next, the party office in every neighborhood that needs help, filled with volunteers who have learned that the joy of life comes only through service. My advice to the activists is to look at the work of groups like ACORN and other groups that work to make everyday life more joyful for our people. Get involved with them. There are simply not enough of us to affect a dramatic political change as things stand today. So we must labor happily in these vineyards until we are enough and we must open the eyes and minds of our neighbors. Just as the religious groups go door to door with their pamphlets, mm. so must we, with pamphlets that fill in the gaps of information about our government, our environment, and our situation in America and around the world. These activities, working with people who need help and spreading the truth, must be joined and our put political work will come easier. Look at me. I am still alive and I am looking at you and you are all alive. <laughs> this is our world as much as anyone else's. We who are old enough or wise enough to see the edges of life can understand that we have a choice between fear and joy and between victimization and service. All elections and other indications to the contrary, happy days are here again when we but say they are. We do not turn our hearts away from injustice or suffering. Indeed, we mend them as best we can with our joyful engagement and our courageous non-cooperation with the forces of fear and death and no one can take away our joy, for even our suffering for justice and brotherhood is joyful. And this is our velvet revolution, American style. We resist what we must and what we can, but our victory is not in defense, but in a cultural offensive made irresistible by the power of love and courage, pulling our people together and our own lives together over time. We have tried this before in America. Things got in our way. Drugs, wars, fears. We became parents. We became det detracted. It is now time to get it right. Thank you. Would you like to uh, uh, interpret for me? I have asked uh, Miss Randy. I have asked Randy to interpret your questions because even though I have very expensive hearing aids, they don't always work for me. <laughs> so, uh, if you wish to make a statement, all right. But give me a, a question at the end. Thank you. In the pink in the back. Well, I was. I was arrested twice. But you know, I was, I met Kathy Kelly the other day in, in, and she's in um, uh, Chicago. She's been arrested 60 times, 60 times. So I'm, I'm a novice, I tell you. I did get arrested, but it was planned beforehand. We went into the, the um, house 
people's, people's Hall in Washington, D.C. And we had told them that we were going to be there. And it just happened that there were a lot of kids there. And they saw me and started screaming, go, Granny, go. <laughs> <laughs> so, can't do that. Right. Yeah. League of Women Voters in Oregon, they're asking all the congressional candidates one question, the very first question. How would you recommend to support congressional campaign finance reform? How would you support what? Uh, congressional campaign. Congressional campaign reform. Uh, how would you support reform. As before? Yeah. How would yes. You well, what you need to do, of course, is to have public funding at the state level for your candidates. And we now have Arizona and Maine, and just two months ago, we finally, and at last, a, the first legislature passed clean elections in Connecticut. I've been out and working ever since 2000, trying to get a campaign finance reform for elections at the state level, and I have not been successful ever. And so this is a watershed. This is really something. The governor got arrested and put in jail because of corruption. And his lieutenant governor, Jody Rell, was able to get it passed in her legislature. And I say, hooray! <laughs> Reverend Desmond Tutu said, to be neutral is to be on the side of the oppressor. How do we get people to not be neutral, but to step up because going to a, a demonstration is not enough? I think they have to be, be, become aware that we have to let them know what is going on. I don't think that people know in this country what is going on. They don't understand that we are really in a serious condition. As I said in my speech, we're all happy, we're having a good time, and why should we worry uh, as long as you, and, and when I, in 1998, my idea was to get the right man elected. And if I did that, he took care of things, and, uh, and that's it. That's what we pay them for, isn't it? Well, that isn't the way it works, ladies and gentlemen. If you're in a democracy, you have got to do your share of it. You have to keep an eye out on what is going on in your government. And if, as has happened uh, in the last few years, gradually, slowly, the the uh, um, corporations have taken over our White House, they have taken over our Senate, they have taken over our House of Representatives, and they have taken over some of our judges. We've let them do it. It's a matter of history. It just happened. I'm not bashing corporations. They're our wealth. They're what give us employment. But they don't belong in politics. It's illegal, and they need to get the hell out. <laughs> However, they are the ones that give money and illegal money to candidates for them to run. And unless you want, unless you want only millionaires taking over, you need to do something for them. Because if we take away the illegal money that is given to them by corporations, you've got to replace it, haven't you? You've got to give them public funding, public funding in, instead of. And if you don't do that, then you're not doing your job. And it costs about nine-tenths less uh, to have uh, to to give them public funding rather than leave the situation as we have today you understand that they own the corporations own most of our, our elected officials and therefore uh, those uh, elected officials are working for them not for us and they make rules that makes it for the makes it necessary uh, to pay our, our taxes by the government to the corporations because of the laws that are being made for the benefit of the donors. And that ends up with uh, uh, giving them subsidies from our tax 
dollars. Now, a subsidy is not a loan. A subsidy is a gift that is given by the government to a corporation or an entity whose service, whose product is for the good of all, for the good of all. And the reason I went walking across the United States was because I saw an article saying that in the middle of the night, two members of the House of Representatives added a $50 million subsidy to a tobacco company onto a law that was being passed to be signed by, by a cab, at that time, President, uh, President Clinton. I am a great grandmother, and I think only humility. <coughs> humility and what? Modesty, Modesty could uh, uh, ke keep you from using that title. Or, yeah. Keep using. Well, I don't know about that. I have sixteen great grandchildren, and I'm not. Call I, they call me Granny D, not Great Granny D. <laughs> but I. I'm working, I'm working for those 16 great grandchildren and for all the children in this country. The kind of a legacy that we are leaving for, for our great grandchildren and our grandchildren today is a, a shocker. It is very, very bad. It's certainly nothing like what our father, forefathers left us. And I feel that if we don't do something about it, it they'll curse us for letting this opportunity that we have today. We have a small window of opportunity in which we can do something about what is going on in this country. And if we don't do it, they're going to curse us and say, why didn't you do it? Why? Here we are burdened with this great debt and our Bill of Rights is tattered, and all of these things have happened, and you didn't do anything about it. Joy in between fear. Between joy and fear. Mm. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> I just know I do. I know that I'm afraid, not afraid of anybody, but I'm in such a good position. You see, I'm 96 years old, and nobody is dependent on me. Huh and I don't need to, and so anything that I do is extra. <laughs> so, so I do it. But I know that there is a lot of fear in this country. I think that what, uh, what the Patriot Act has done to us, now you expect people are coming in and looking at stuff in your books and going to your library and looking to see, in my little library, in a of 1400 we have a big sign up there don't ask me who gives who who reads what because I won't tell you <laughs> on that note what do you read that keeps you informed uh, I I, I live in the country so I and recently I haven't been able to walk town to the, the local store. So I get the newspaper, I get the New York Times on Sundays, and I read it cover to cover and spend a lot of time on it. Um, then I look at internet, and I have truth out there, and I have, and I can go in to get the headlines of the New York Times. And to tell you the God's honest truth, that's about it. I don't, I was moved when I became 96. My son decided I shouldn't be living by myself anymore. So he moved me to his home, and I don't have my radio set up, have, I mean TV set up. For, so I've been there a year, and I, I don't miss it. So I, so I let it, let it go, but that's really all I have, and th that seems to be uh, pretty good. Yeah, you don't need to spend your whole day looking at news. <laughs> well, I do have a lot of people that write to me and say you're my inspiration. I'm starting to walk again. I'm if you get involved, if you get involved with something that's more important than you, that you will be amazed how fast life will go. <laughs> you can't believe that something. I don't know what. I, it's crazy. I, I have no idea. But I've, how the time goes away. 
and, and you're having a good time too. <laughs> if you get involved uh, thinking that you're involved with something that's more important than you are, it makes all the difference. It keeps you from being uh, blue, from being uh, tired, because you take, you take little cat naps. <laughs> That's what you do when you're 96. <laughs> but the big important thing is to have joy, to be good to other people, to not expect other people to think the way you think and, and that you have to think the way they think. That's what's killing us. Do you know uh, Howard Zinn wrote an article recently and he called it After the War and what he said, let's not have another war. All we do is have one war after the other. And do you know, they're all religiously in, uh, started. They all have to do with religion. Think what you want to think and let somebody else think what they want to think. None of us really knows the truth, do we? None of us knows. <coughs> I could be dead five minutes from now. I'm 96 years old. I don't know whether there's anything out there or not. I've gone to church all my life, but maybe I was wrong. <laughs> you know, you have to face that. So, and what difference will it make to me? None. Or to anybody else that's left behind. It's what you do for other people that counts and they remember you and saying, well, she was a crazy old lady, but she was all right. <laughs> you want to leave behind a little reputation, you know. That's all, that's all good that you can do. I think that everybody that wants to go to college should be able to go. I think, yeah. I think it should be the same uh, as going to high school. This world needs more and better education. And, and I think that the, we are rich people and there's no reason to forget about wars. Have education instead. <laughs> it costs us a lot less. Uh, now even K through 12 is not being sufficiently funded in Oregon. So you may not even have the same K through 12 that you're used to having. The terrible thing about education today, I mean, to take down this big complex here in Eugene, a big complex where people can go to, people can go to, to college and without it, they won't be able to because everything will be too expensive for them to do. To suddenly just decide to tear it down and, and put something else up there. That is so unkind, so cruel. What is the matter with people today? The kindness is gone. Why is money so damned important? Why is the bottom line so more important? You can't eat the green stuff. You can't, you can't, you can't eat it. You can't wear it. It's no good. So why, why just do the things that, that make it more, uh, more money? I would. I went to Emerson College. I was there for three years and they kicked me out because I got married. Nowadays, you can get married and still go to church, still go to, to school because there is affordable housing and that should be the way it is. I mean, we as people, are, um, when we get to be 17, 18, 19, we begin to want to get married and to have to wait until you're 30 is crazy. <laughs> and to have a school in one part of the town that's like a, that's like a, 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 a country club, and on the other side, something that you're ashamed to go into. That is not fair. That is so unkind to, to leave the people who have less money have a, a, a a worse school. They should have the best school. They should have the best teachers because they haven't been, been treated the way these kids that are over here. That isn't right. Why can't we see that? That it isn't fair. People 
I can't say it. It's so, it's so unfair. I mean, it, there was a time when, when employers were worried about their employees that were good to them, knew who their children were, and didn't expect to, to be, make billions of dollars. Mm -hmm. They expected them all to do well. Not only themselves, but the people that are working for them. Your children, and you want them to grow up what? Choosing joy. And not Choosing joy. Have it in your family. Have it in your house. You have it. If you have it, they'll get it. No problem at all. Yes. And if you haven't got it, find out why. <laughs> You are not doing enough <laughs> for other people. Uh, yes. um, do you want to take any more? Uh, yeah. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, what did you learn um, politically on your walk across America? Ah. I stopped and talked with big people. I walked only 10 miles a day. You know, I had an interview with somebody in Connecticut a, a few minutes ago before this, and it was a fellow by the name of Joe Hurley, and he couldn't wait to tell me that he had walked across the country too. He had walked across Connecticut. It was 120 miles. And he said, I felt so good and I was so proud. And the photographer uh, that was with me, we wrote stories about it and everything. And then he said, I read in the paper about this old woman <laughs> who was walking across the country and she was walking in, in Texas. And I said, well, it was such fun doing uh, Connecticut. Wouldn't it be fun to do the whole and he did it. He did it recently. And he's finished, and now there's a book coming out on it. And, uh, but uh, it was really nice. I stopped and talked. I stopped and talked with people all along the way and let them tell me what the problem is. Let them tell me why it is. It, mostly, you know what it was? They worried about their kids. It's so important to them that their kids don't have a decent school or their kids need to go to college and want to go to college and can't go to college. They don't like the, what is being left to their children, this great debt and this fact that this idea, see, people, are, people, if, it's, if it's not fair, it's what bothers people. The fact that our present administration takes money and gives it to rich people, that's not fair, is it? No. That's not fair. And that's what they hate, something that isn't fair. Or the school isn't as good as the next one because one is a good town and one is not. So you take each person that you meet the next, the next week. See how many people you can sell on the idea of public funding. Mm -hmm. How many people do you dare to talk to? Don't sit there and keep your mouth shut. Get busy and talk. And if they don't like it, keep right on talking. <laughs> Do you ever get invited by groups not like these? I mean, do you ever get invited to speak to business corporate groups or something like that? No, no. <laughs> they, they, they boycotted my book. Yes, I'm looking for men. <laughs> um, I think when you were doing your walk, I was actually in Texas, but I had read that, are you from uh, Dublin? Yes. Okay. I, um, I'm i from Antrim. Are you? Yes. Where? Um, 23 West Street. <laughs> <laughs> and um, um, I actually came out of solidarity for uh, Granite Staters. And I just wanted to let you know that you remind me a lot of uh, my favorite mountain, which is Monadnock. Uh. It is very old, but um, when translated into English, Monadnock is the mountain that stands alone. And I'm honored yes. to. Yes, and it's the name for a lot, a lot of other. I have been throughout the world have been named Monadnock after that one. It. More people walk up Mount Monadnock than Fuji. It used to be. It was number two after Fuji. Now it's number one. Yeah. <laughs>
<laughs> yes. I'd like to say uh, I understand where that person was coming from about preaching, about preaching to the choir. But what is good is is for the choir to get together once in a while to be inspired and uplifted and encouraged, and that's what uh, events like this do for me. Yes. Right. You're not alone. Let me tell you that I didn't walk across this country without hundreds of people helping me do it. Everywhere, people helped. And, and if you try to do something that's beyond you, other people step out and help. People in this country are good, kind people. They really are. Even, even the, the rich employers can get to them if you uh, hit it right, yes. You know, I ran for the, the Senate in 2004. <laughs> in 2004. <laughs> and, I, and I raised a, a, more money than I had earned, I guess, the rest of my previous life. Mm -hmm. People were kind, and, and so, so if it's something that they believe in, uh, they will do it, yes. I, I feel very badly having all those people send me money and then I didn't win. <laughs> I felt very sorry about it, but uh, I tried hard. Yes, do you understand that what the, you've got to do? Try to find s 10 different people in the next month who don't understand that there's corruption in this country and explain to them about it and explain to them. I would like it to be a household phrase, public funding at the, at the, at the state level. Public funding for elections at the state level. Remember that. Public. <laughs> <laughs> it has, you must flood the whole country with that idea. If you start talking about it, it can happen. Write your letters. Everybody that's got a computer, send that a message to your addressees. Everyone, send it. It must be public funding at the state level for um, candidates, for elections. And you're not bashing. I'm not bashing the corporations. And I, and I don't believe that the, that the uh, officials are crooked or dis, dis, dishonest. It's because the system is what the system is. It's what they what has developed, and it has to be stopped. And they can't stop it. You see, it's up to us to do it for them. They won't do it, they can't do it. It's up to us to do it. So if you're not doing your job, unless you get busy and do it, okay? I think that's about a, a good, yeah. uh, yes. Last comment. Okay. My name is Santush, I'm running for US Congress without corporation money. Without, he's running for Congress without uh, contribution money. Yeah, that's right. Right. And run for Congress. <laughs> run for, 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 well, looking for people that are willing to run. Run for uh, an official. Run for an official job. Go. If you feel the urge, do it. And, and it's a lot of fun. <laughs> It really is. A lot of fun, and I think that's about it. <laughs> thank you. Hi. Uh, thank you all for coming, and thank you for your inspiring yes. presence. I have been with this person for two hours. And, oh. <laughs> <laughs>